Yes, thanks. So as the introduction said, this talk is about skicomp.alto.v and how it's built with Sphinx and some of the history and like background that you might need to modify it and where we will go in the future. So as before, I share a vertical screen here. So half your screen is for me and half is for you to follow along or do what you'd like. So my talk is actually self-hosting. So my talk is contained within skicomp.alto.v itself. And I will present it using this thing called uh, MiniPres, which converts a Sphinx site to something that's somewhat like a presentation. So let's get started. So the basics. And so as before, questions are here. Please write your questions anytime and I'll answer either live or at the end, depending on what's most appropriate. So, so skicomp.alto.v is the home of Alto Scientific Computing's documentation. So before 2017, it was Triton's documentation using Alto's Confluence Wiki. Now it has information on many different topics about scientific computing. So it's not just Triton, but some of the introduction to Alto resources, training, data management, research software engineers, and other things. It's ranked somewhat highly in search engines, as in it's not too hard to find it. Um, and occasionally as we're searching for problems, we end up back at our own documentation, which always shows that we're in sort of deep. And if anyone's interested, the scripts to convert the site to restructured text from Confluence can be found here. So maybe before we go too far, we can talk about what are the properties of good documentation? Well, there's obviously organized and easy to use. Um, there's versions, so you can tell what the former versions are. It would be nice if anyone can contribute and it's not locked behind a few people. You'd want it to be shareable, reusable, licensed, so that, well, anything you do can be used by others. And well, we care about open science, so that means it's not just uh, the science that comes out, but our processes. No lock-in is quite important. You don't want some proprietary system, which will take a huge amount of work to transfer anywhere else. Plain text is always good, so that 50 years of Unix text, text processing tools can all work and do things. There's countless times I grep for the, through the documentation to find one thing that needs to be updated everywhere, like some slurm option or something. Ideally, it shouldn't be standalone, so we can directly pull in other materials, like you have the script and you can include it with literal include, and the script is also usable otherwise. And well, to combine all of the above together, something like Git is natural, and that's what we've got. So our basic documentation stack is we have a Git repository for the docs. It's hosted on GitHub. The documentation is written in restructured text or markdown. So really it's mostly restructured text. And then it's built with Sphinx with various extensions. And then the web server is hosted on a free service called read the docs. So maybe to go through, I can demonstrate making a change in the docs and uh, get right to it. So there's this checklist here that I want to add to this. Mm. So this page here is the research software engineer page on skicomp.alto.v. And I want to add another link right below here. So let's see how this would work. So, okay, here's my terminal. Mm. Let me know if this is not readable. So I've already cloned the Git repository, so I won't go through anything new. So the URL I want to add it to is RSE. 
So let's see what files we have here. Well, we have a directory called RSE. So let's use Emacs to open RSE. So what's in here? Well, there's a bunch of stuff, but index looks like the right thing. So index. Okay. Let's scroll down. And we see under the thing there is checklist. So now we see the first main point about the docs. So this is not just a bullet list like you see here, but within Sphinx, there's the semantic structure of the table of contents tree, which is used to mm, like build the tree structure, which is what you see on the documentation sidebar. So how can we add a external link to this? So I'll copy it. Let's come back here. So mm, let's look. So it looks like a checklist here. And if I zoom out, then the sidebar appears and you see how there's these things on the sidebar and it maps to the different sections you see here, like about research software engineers, top three, community become an RSC community become an RSC. So under checklists, um, so I will use a little trick here and I will say, um, I will add it like this. Oops. So I know So within these table of contents trees, you can also have external links like this. This is a little known feature, but let's do it. So I will save the file, go back to the shell. And since this is about Sphinx and not about Git, I will quickly use my Git PR utility to make this. Uh, Git PR new. Um, JOSS checklist. I will add the file. I will commit. Uh, I'll say add link to the JOSS checklist. Save. And now I use. Mm, let's see. There's some option here. actually have a shell alias that I use for this. Okay, so there goes the pull request. So let's see what happens. If we go to GitHub, we see under pull requests, there's several open, but I see it's open here. And if I click, you can see, well, there's no description, the title's good enough, files changed, I see what's added. And now here there is a check that's in progress. So this is checking for any warnings that Sphinx may have. So I have this configured where some things will be completely, will have be fa failures and stop the build, and some are just warnings. If I click on details, I see, okay, so it's building. And this is GitHub Actions here, which is a quite nice surface for testing things. Maybe while this is running, I can show how you would test it locally. If you do make check, uh, actually I usually do clean check, then it will do the checks. And surprisingly, it doesn't fail. I thought I would have to activate the virtual environment. But anyway, make check uses the same 
settings that the GitHub Actions uses to test. But GitHub Actions is set to ignore different warnings. Like here we see, we saw a bunch of warnings about things that are not in the... Oh. So this is because the virtual environment is inactivated. Some of these other ones are documents are not included in the table of contents tree, which will, we just don't have everything there because some is included. But at the end we see, okay, no errors. So that means there's no fatal errors. If we come back here, we see it finished. Hmm. Do I have to refresh? I'll check successful. So I can now merge the pull request. If you would like to preview this locally first, you can do make, actually make clean HTML is done as part of the uh, make clean check process. But anyway, builds and well, now I have to wait for it to build again, which will take a little while, but the outputs get put in the underscore build HTML directory where it can be viewed with a browser. And there you go. So you can open this and check it out. So that's the basic summary of the process. Let's see. Did I merge it already? No. So I'll click merge, confirm delete the branch, and I'm all done. Okay, so I think this has basically been everything. So it'll take a few more minutes for read the docs to build it, so that way we can see it uh, at the end. I see no questions so far. Please comment there. Okay. So now we get to the details, and this is basically what I've already shown. Um, let's see, the extra notes here are there's a requirements.txt file that includes all the Python dependencies to build it, but it's also buildable with stock um, Debian and Ubuntu packages. So you don't have to do this extra installation in order to run things. The comp.py file contains all of the Sphinx configuration. The index.rst is the root of all docs. So this has the root table of contents tree directive. And makefile is used to build it. So this is basically a wrapper to the Sphinx build command. Um, make clean, search, check, whatever. Sphinx auto build is a nice utility. So it starts a web server and rebuilds it when any file is files changed. And you can build the results in build. And yeah, so there's this question coming up about the search working on local preview. So this is a static search. So if we look in the preview, build HTML, let's see. Maybe under static. Anyway, it compiles all of the search terms into some sort of JavaScript file, which is then usable to do the search. Let's see, that's not it. Well, someone can find this and put it in the HackMD. I don't need to answer this myself necessarily. But yeah, so search is client side in the browser by loading a JSON file that contains all of the terms in the whole site. So it doesn't require any server side support to build. Okay. One could also edit the docs on the web. So if you come to any particular page, Let's see, mm, let's come back to the code. Let's say I want to edit that same page. 
I can navigate to RSE and then index. I can click edit. Okay, here is edit. And then I can add something new. And if I scroll down, then you can give the message and either commit directly to the main branch or make a pull request on a default branch. So this doesn't require using the command line to edit. So it actually is somewhat accessible to everyone. Could we recommend using this more so that more people can contribute to our docs? Okay. One of the key points here is the Sphinx table of contents tree, which is how all of the material is organized. So within the, well, we saw the example here. There's a table of contents tree and you can give these directives different options. Like here, it will go only to a certain depth in showing the subsections. And then you include the different pages in it. You can use wildcards and so on. And then each of these pages is scanned for its own table of contents tree to be to have the sub pages inserted and so on and so on. Sphinx internally goes and builds the structure and then uses it to write things out. So I won't do this myself, but as an example, you can follow the talk three directives from index to alto index to alto Jupyter hub to alto Jupyter hub instructors index and so on. So it makes sense. You can basically add things for complicated cases, like the difference between having talk trees in sections or talk trees not in sections on pages. Well, just give it a try and find out. And like, I don't think, and ask someone if there's help. I don't think there's much more to be said there. So arrangement of the site. So skicomp.alto.fi started from the Triton wiki. It then grew these other top level sections for other things and basically more and more got added there. And really it's about time to rethink how it's organized. So is there a better way to do things? Is there too much here? Should something be hidden? Um, should the main page be more or less verbose? Um, yeah, but this is something we can discuss after the talk. But most of the sections are sort of historical things that I added because I thought they were useful and made sense. And um, it hasn't really been master planned beyond what you see here right now. Okay, other details about the site. So Sphinx is a full fledged extendable documentation generator. So it has many extensions, like there's Sphinx Gits tab, which provides modification times for pages individually. Uh, I'll read the docs theme, these things. There's basically so many different extensions that we can use for different things. Um, and I've invented, invested a lot of time in um, digging into this quite deeply. Mm. And I quite like it. It's written in Python and a quite good tool. So restru restructure text. Um, why restructure text instead of markdown? Well, markdown was basically made as a thin wrapping over HTML. But to make high quality docs like this, some sort of, some more structure is needed. Like these table of contents tree and other directives. So now there is a parser called my structured text, or maybe it's called markedly structured text. Yeah, markedly structured text, um, which is a reasonable alternative to restructured text. But really, it's more like a different restructured text syntax than markdown. But it's sort of forced into the markdown limitations. Um, markdown also. I like to say Markdown is dead. So of course it's being used everywhere, but the original creator of Markdown says, I don't want anything else being called Markdown. The specification should never evolve. So basically there's something called, called common mark where people try to standardize things. 
but all the different syntaxes are so different, there's no real portability between different things beyond simple things like sections and bold and links, um, which is a bit of a problem in portability. Let's see. Well, you can read about restructured text and I'll hear more if you would like. Um, let's see. Oh, there's a good question, Sphinx versus LaTeX. Can we contrast them? So yeah, I'd like to say that Markdown is like HTML and restructured text is like LaTeX. So really restructured text is different from Sphinx. It's maintained in a different project, which Sphinx uses, which occasionally every so often when the restructured text project, which is called DocuTils changes, Sphinx will have some sort of errors or problems in it. Mm. But those are usually pretty quickly discovered and fixed. So I would say Sphinx in restructured text is like, um, like LaTeX, um, but a more readable LaTeX. So something that's reasonable to read in the plain text format. Mm. Yeah, so some of the most surprising restructured text points. So the literals have double quotes like this. So why is that? Well, it's because the single quotes are used for other links and references. So there, for example, there's more internal references within a document than external references usually. And the internal references is what single quotes is used for. But this is configurable. You can make single quote, quote take on any role you wanted. Uh, links are scoped. So here we see examples of the single quotes being used to refer to another document or to a reference. And there's lots of other things you can use for Sphinx here. Like for example, you can use this to re refer directly to a Python, um, Python object, which can link to the upstream Python docs. This is called interspinx. And underscores, or links have two underscores after them like this. One underscore actually works, but then this text gets taken as a reference target and can be used in this kind of reference, I think. And if there's ever two links with one underscore in the same text, then weird things happen. Okay, the GitHub action check, provide warnings on errors. So we can, in fact, see that here. Let's look at an example. I hope it appears. Oh, uh, here we go. So we see a warning within um, so here. There's a matcher which matches the problems to the locations. This was actually not caused by this pull request, but a long running problem, which is still in here. And here we see the errors and why things fail. And here we see a link that doesn't have underscores after it. Okay, the actions view I already showed in a previous demo. And I have these uh, checks as relatively strict. Um, and I've disabled some options that make more flexible restructured text with the idea that explicit is better than implicit. So if we want our docs to be reusable in other projects, we should be the explicit ones and strict ones. Okay, before we get to little known features, there was a comment on the licensing model. Yes, Creative Commons by was used. Yeah. Okay, so little known features. We could use Markdown or Jupyter Notebooks for pages if we wanted, and it all works basically together. Mm -hmm. But restructured text really is nicer for this kind of documentation than trying to shove directives into common mark. It's compatible with many other projects. So Sphinx is used for documentation of many Python and other projects. It's used in recent code refinery lessons, for example, code refinery manuals, um, many things. So stuff can be copied around easily. Hmm. A comment of the previous thing here. 
uh, why is it CC BY and not SHARE LIKE? Well, we sort of discussed among ourselves and um, did things. Uh, and yeah, the authors are not visible. Yeah, the authors are not visible other than the git history. I guess we could do something about that if someone's interested. Um, yeah, perhaps we should look into that. Okay, mini press. So this um, this thing I built uses some client-side JavaScript to turn any page into a presentation format. And well, I've been giving you a demo of it right now. So I don't really know JavaScript or these things. So if someone could help do it more properly, that would be really interesting. Redirect to HTTPS. So read the docs doesn't natively do this for external domains. So it's done with JavaScript and maybe someone could improve this. Mm. Other output formats. Sphinx can output to other formats such as PDF, single page, HTML, EPUB, manual pages, and so on. Perhaps there would be a use for this somehow, somewhere. There's this extension substitution, which is more powerful than um, a simple like replacement substitution, which could be used for making the site more general. Maybe as a demonstration, like I have some images in here now. Yeah, so here we have a demo. So there's a replacement and there's a substitution, which is the ID of the substitution and then the original text. So when it's built, um, you can see the substitution inserted in like this. You can build it showing the originals, or you can build it showing both the original ID and substitution. And the point of this is that it's easy to keep all of these substitutions in sync. So if it's just a plain substitution, you have to basically look through all the documentation to see what all the substitutions are. And anytime something changes, then it has to be updated. Um, yeah. And it can also produce a list of all the IDs, all the original text, and all of the replacement text. This could perhaps be useful for other sites to um, like make their own custom version of this. Okay, a Sphinx git stamp puts a timestamp on the bottom of every page. You can scroll down and see it yourself. So there's some open questions here. Um, should we use pull request or not? Um, when do we push directly? And I think in practice, both are fine. It's up to you to decide. And if you're the main maintainer of something and you don't expect anyone to give useful contributions, then, well, just push directly. Why not? Sharing with other sites. Um, we had a long-term plan to share skicomp.altofop.p with other sites so they could customize it for their own tutorials. Um, this hasn't really been done yet, and by now the docs are so complex, I'm not even sure if it's a reasonable thing to do. Or maybe in order to do this, we need to split it up into several different sub-projects, and then we could share it a little bit more easily. Because everything is plain text, you can import one Sphinx project into another using git submodules and then the top three to refer to the other things inside of it. Um, other, others at Skicom Altofi can use the docs as their place. Like for example, Alto Linux people could be invited to use it. Um, maybe there's some other department ITs that's tired of using the other options and we could combine things together. Um, there's a lot of possibilities here. Can we make the docs more testable? So one dream we've had is to um, make our examples testable where 
you can basically clone it onto Triton and then run PyTest or something on it, and it would tell you if all the docs are still up to date and they still work. Um, for example, this, what we see here, includes everything that's needed. There's a restructured text file that includes Python OpenMP, and it also includes the Slurm script. And if we go back, we see, well, the raw OpenMP file and the raw Slurm script. <coughs> Could we somehow link these together so everything can be automatically tested? So in practice, we're not too far from that, but how do we do that without making another layer of writing to connect things together and defining this? I think it might not be too difficult with uh, making some Sphinx directives or tags which can say, this directive indicates what the Slurm script is. This indicates what the other scripts are, or something like that. Integrated HPC examples. So we have an examples tree here, which has a bunch of examples, and a separate repository, which HPC examples. Can these be unified and the second included as a submodule in there? Could we stop using read the docs? now. So by now we have GitHub pages that could also host this um, just as well. Yeah, that's a good question. How can we keep things up to date? So it requires continuous work just like any documentation. What should the th threshold be for removing old material? There's this extension that you can use to put a date into pages and it will warn you when a page hasn't been looked at or as the metaphor goes, dusted off recently. This is something we clearly need to think more about. So visitor stats. So read the docs provide limited visitor stats based on web server logs. Um, I'm sort of opposed to using detailed individual web tracking but is there some way to get detailed, more detailed stats without tracking people individually? Mm -hmm. I guess if we hosted this on our own web server, we could have the full web server logs and do anything we wanted. And finally, for building a community, is there any way to get more people to contribute to this? Mm -hmm. So where is it hosted? Right now it's hosted on readthedocs.org, which I can come and demonstrate here. So logged in, we're at Projects Alto Ski Comp. There's an admin area, which includes, well, the main things which someone might use are, well, actually we can look here, uh, traffic analytics. So we see over the past 30 page, the view statistics. So we can see where people end up. Yeah, but this is basically the extent of it. Oh, and if I turned on JavaScript, we can probably see something more. Yes, there we go. Daily page view totals. Mm. Oh, it also shows some search statistics, what people search for. Mm. Yeah. So we pay five euros or dollars per month for Read the Docs Gold, which removes the advertisements from open source projects. Let's see. Oh, I mean. If someone needs to, they can come through and search through this. Uh, if you look at versions, you can see the latest version. You can edit, and he, sometimes you would wipe and rebuild it if things go wrong. So the next question, is there a way to make part of the documentation private? So since everything is in one Git repository, that's sort of difficult, but well, this is text files in a Git repository. 
so we can easily have two Git repos repositories, one that's public and one that's private. And you host them separately, and the web server provides access control however you might want. Or you could have them as sub-modules of each other, or, you know, um, as sub-projects in the web server tree. And then um, limit the access however you would like with normal web auth. So, yeah. So if there's no more questions, I will stop the... Well, I'll give another few minutes for presentation for questions which should be on video, and then I will stop the recording. And we can see what is... Mm, what discussion there's have via Zoom. Okay, well, there's nothing more, so thanks for listening, and I hope this has been a useful tour of what we do. I guess as a summary, there is really a great value to having documentation version controlled in plain text format, and there's many different tools for this. And of them, Sphinx is a pretty good tool to build on. So I guess, Thanks a lot.